going live. Hello, creatives, community kind folks out there. I was going down a rabbit hole off camera, but now that the camera's rolling, we have ourselves um, classmates and collegiates as well joining in these live chats each day, 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, once you find it, you'll, you'll be able to discover it, whatever. So what do we do here? Well, we like to talk about something for the whole week. This week, we're talking about beasts. And what's today? Well, today's kind of a, a catch-all. It's Discord Tuesday. And today, we tend to go a little, maybe a little bit deeper into mechanics. And we're talking about the creature type of beasts and adding them into our tabletop role-playing games. Yesterday was Monster Monday. Today, we're going to talk about um, adding these extra animals and such, and maybe adding in a little bit of the theme. Um, Themes I was talking about with our um, in the Discord down in the boiler room uh, before the camera start rolling. Um, that a lot of times when we talk about uh, adding animals and beasts into the game, they although they may add some flavor into the world, a lot of times they start to fall to the way, wayside. So Monster Monday, we talked about um, using beasts as everything from um, exploring and uh, giving information about uh, the locations in your world, whether it's mountainous or uh, desert or, you know, aquatic, coastal, wetlands and swamplands and such, and using them as mounts and beasts and uh, animals of labor, using, eating them, of course, raising, raising them as stock, uh, raising them as uh, societal, as a a means of measuring your societal power, uh, much as, as a person who owns a large farm or a person who owns racehorses or racing camels, um, breeding them for their speed or endurance or, or beauty or color, um, breeding them for their aggression or uh, breeding, breeding out their uh, feral and bestial natures to make them more domesticated as well. Uh, but we can also... One of the things that I am a huge proponent of, it kind of is why I'm the self-appointed third pillarist, is not only are we going to have our encounters with, with our beasts, and we, we kind of defined dire beasts, um, dire wolves, dire <laughs> chihuahuas even yeah, from yesterday, but uh, a lot of those, those extremely feral animals come from someplace, and uh, to reiterate something I brought up off camera was it's not just being attacked by a crocodile. It's being attacked by a crocodile in, you know, waist deep water in an environment where uh, swarms of bugs are around you and biting at you and something, someone or something grabs the ankle or grabs the waist of one of the PCs and drags them under the water. And so you have this compound situation of not only fighting uh, beasts, but fighting them in an environment. And so the reason why I'm a huge proponent of this is because, <laughs> yeah. the reason why I'm a huge proponent of this is because um, the third pillar of gaming, the environment has a huge effect on our interactions with the things around us in a, in effect, Every wild animal would prefer to live in an environment which is its own lair, right? It, uh, lowercase l for lair, although it could very easily become like <laughs> become um, a, a, a a capital L for the lair. Uh, ooh, a wet sarlacc. I like that. <laughs> I like that a lot. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So some of those rabbit holes have thorns and, and roots and possible spikes. Yeah, uh, def absolutely, man. Um, it's the it's the idea of falling into something, and you're like, oh, this isn't so bad. And then you go to get the hell out, and you're like, if I rip my ankle out of this, it's going to shred the whole thing. Ugh. Um, fifth file. I hope I'm pronouncing it that correctly. Fifth file <laughs> says. Technically, it's afternoon here. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So, one of the things um, I I know a lot of this is ref we can 
shift over to our third pillar Thursday, um, uh, third pillar of exploration day, which is going to be on Thursday, of course. Oh, fifth vial. There we go. Uh, if if I mispronounced it, I prefer fifth vial. Um, so I'm going to stick with that pronunciation. Now, the today we, well, I want to talk a little bit about some of the mechanics of adding in uh, adding in beasts. Um, anything from the the dire or giant sized animals that are in the world, as well as some of the more our acceptance of some of the more arcane creatures like Pegasi, um, maybe even owl bears, and <laughs> you're, you're uh, sorry, Fifth, but you're barking up the wrong tree. I tend to mispronounce everything, <laughs> and, and, and every once in a while, a, a dead man will tell me, "Yeah, you got it right." Ah, you effed it up again. So, so, so it'll be all right. Uh, so the idea for for us is to not only just include some of these beasties and use some of their stat blocks and and make them an encounter, but it's the idea of of making the encounter dynamic as possible, and meaning okay, it's not PCs go around the corner, you see a cave bear, roll initiative, fight the cave bear, right? It is. Is the cave pe cave bear protecting its young? Um, are they mating? And then, if they are, um, is there a is the lion on the Serengeti the 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 leader of the pride, and the others are its you know its um, uh, essentially um, humanistically wise female subjects and such? Does it have more hit points? Is it faster? Is it tougher? Is it more perceptive in its ability to hunt after something? Um, are, is the animal diseased and carrying a disease? And there's a possibility that after it, after its, um, you know, it rabies type infection or something, and it's, you know, snarling and um, foaming at the mouth, is there a chance the PCs may, may catch that disease? And um, are the, are the jackals or, or hyenas surrounding the party and using using stealth and using uh, tactics to surround the party and come after them. Um, are they are they attacking the the lowly halfling left in the back of the party, or are they attacking the strongest character up front to uh, demoralize the rest of them? And I mean, <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, 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 James. Um, giant praying mantis that is removing the head of its mate as you turn. <laughs> yeah, and he's like, maybe we shouldn't have seen that. Ow. <laughs> Rika says, did you, did you interrupt the mating? Bears or lions, are they pissed at you for doing so? Should you run? Uh, hell yeah. Um, uh, lots of animals use... Uh, uh, predatory animals or territorial animals use threats and various methods to uh, dominate other animals for their for their territories. So um, rams and goats and m mooses, <laughs> meese, um, animals with antlers and horns tend to tend to charge. Of each other, and they may even charge, um, charge things that are strange or viewed as a threat. Um, elephants do the same thing; they will protect their their um, their herd by charging after uh, threats to them and allow the herd to move on. I mean, there's so many there's they have so many behaviors that we can use, and using those behaviors uh, in the game are very interesting yeah um a uh, fifth v also boars are very interesting to observe um <laughs> there is jana hey what's going on there man a long time no here yeah this chat got thirsty all of a sudden uh maybe that's you although i do tend to drink a lot of my almond milk while we do these things so yeah um polaris says animal seasons aren't something that i tend to think about when they're breeding when the babies are born, when they move around, I tend to just go, this thing is here, that thing is there. Exactly. And we we can, listen, we don't need to create an entire, 
we don't need to create an entire industry around the idea of having to uh, detail each and every migratory path of every wild animal in our setting. No, but we can pull on those threads, right? <laughs> yeah, you saw that. Yeah. We can pull on those threads um, by having seasonal changes affects us as human beings. <laughs> Ooh, sensual, yes. Ooh, making love to that mm, uh, almond milk. Wow. No. <laughs> um, the the idea would be that, for example, a a um, coastal village, for example, may uh, during the as the winter season comes upon them and the fishing. The, the, the fish swim off and, you know, the whales move off to another direction. Um, <laughs> they, they may go inland and going inland may be important for them to hunt creatures for their pelts. Uh, maybe what's, what's a good creature that has a nice heavy pelt like uh, bears or seals or something like that. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Rick has said lies. You need to know all the migratory hunting patterns of all your imaginary monster beasts. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a, a Pegasus, like, do they do they travel in herds like wild horses? Um, because in my mind, I always think of, of a Pegasus, not Pegasi, but do they do that? Do they teach their young how to fly? Are there 30 mile wide territorial hunting grounds for the Pegasus. I mean, you know, and uh, many people follow uh, herd animals. They follow the migratory paths of birds. They understand, you know, when the winter comes to tell, you know, strangers, like you don't want to go out into those woods because they're, they're hunting and getting ready for the, the coming winter, and it's going to be far more dangerous. They're more, far more feral. And so there may be this idea that people are battening down the hatches or a border borderland community might be getting ready for a hunt. Um, even in our own, own lives, there are uh, there's hunting seasons. And, you know, oh, for, for six weeks, we're going to go hunt. I don't know, deer or um, uh, jackals or um, any number of types of creatures, whether they're aquatic or land-based or flying um, during a particular season. Maybe a, a village is in the path of a migratory path of some sorts of fantastical beasts and on their way to go from I don't know, the deep ocean up into the mountains or something. The people are like, yes, they're coming. They're, they're coming out of the ocean again. All right, everybody get ready with your nets and spears and stuff. And that may be, um, may be a reason. And of course, of course, lots of animals are affected by the environment. Earthquakes, forest fires, floods, um, mudslides, um, the incursion of a something debilitating like oh, I don't know, some kind of parasite is starting to sweep through the area. And a lot of the animals are like, I don't know why, but I think we need to get the hell up out of here because there's something something going on, you know, um, without them being able to put their finger on it instinctually. They just say, we're, we're going south because, you know, we are a grazing herd and there's nothing here for us to eat. And we need to move to another area because the forest fires have, have destroyed the area we normally go to. And we no normally go south, but I think there's something to eat down there. So we're going to graze down in those the farmer's pastures or something. And then the, the, the grazing animals in the farmer's pastures bring the ogres who are like, ooh, they're easy pickings in these fields. Let's go after those, I don't know, magical deer or something like that. Uh, um, fifth Vial says, when you were, were talking about differences in hit points, etc., in relation to female and male animals, since in some species, females are larger, absolutely, and more dangerous, and vice versa, would you s suggest that they have variations in hit points and maybe abilities, etc.? Uh, I hope, um, hell yeah. I think not only just variations due to gender, like some, many male animals have an appearance that's different from the female animals to draw the attention of the females, but also size differences based on their 
uh, aggression and importance. So the, the, the alpha male wolf might get like, say a, an extra die bite damage, maybe an extra 10 or 20 foot movement rate. Maybe it has max hit points. Whereas maybe the secondary wolf in the pack may have an extra plus three on its perception and maybe it's got another an extra you know half again as many hit points than average or something like you could you could manipulate and change and kind of twist and modulate your stat blocks which is pretty which you know little plug here is easy enough in fantasy grounds right you can just go in make a copy of the creature and then bump up or bump down some of its abilities um as well as even the PCs finding, let's say, one of those wolves, those those timber wolves with, um, it's got three hit points left and is stumbling along because of a broken leg, and it looks a little diseased. And if the PCs come close to it, it's infected with rock grubs. Right? It's been left behind by the by the pack. The PCs come over and want to, you know, move out the way. I want to kill my experience. I need to kill my experience points and gets, you know, these maggot like things crawls up the PCs arms which is one encounter, and then maybe now this is evidence that, oh, it was left behind by the pack. Maybe there's another pack that, you know, like, what's the movie? The Grey. The, in the movie The Grey, there was a pack of wolves and the people were being attacked by them as well. Um, Ali Oop says, uh, just, just put a base migratory info, not every detail. Exactly. Um, no one is a scientist except maybe a druid or a wizard. <laughs> You're right. Uh, most likely the druid knows the animal habitats and it knows the animal's habits and its habitats, which for me, this is a great opportunity to have those characters grab the spotlight, right? If you're playing the ranger and you're like, oh, man, I don't really get to do rangery things like exploring the woods. This is a great opportunity to say, hey, you ranger PC, this is your specialty. You know that there is where you're entering the territory of these uh this pack of timber wolves you know this already you can you know by scent by by traces by the lack of something in the area you know there's as much information due to missing details due to having details missing as there is to having details in the area when the ranger's like everybody quiet shh you hear that and everyone's like i don't hear anything and ranger's like Exactly. We don't hear anything. There's something going on here. Uh, die roll 16. That's because there's, and then fill in the blanks, right? Um, um, uh, Ali Oops goes on to say, such as birds, males are bright when the female is dull for the male to attract the female. Yep. Would be character, <laughs> would the character lose XP for losing their hand to rock ropes? Uh, I, I, this is a side note. I tend to think of experience as literally the word experience. It has nothing to do with whether you win or lost. It's the experience you receive in doing it. Oh, man. Uh, ooh, all right, Darius. Darius says, can we talk about different fantasy milks? I feel we need to talk about different fantasy milks. <laughs> yeah. Mm, the, the intricacies and the skill involved in milking various fantasy animals. Hmm. <laughs> Can you milk an owlbear? I don't think it would like it unless unless owlbears really love it. It's like rubbing their tummies. Uh, <laughs> yep. Al uh, Oop says uh, the, the silence is most likely an apex predator is in the area. Exactly. And as a matter of fact, that silence could happen all of a sudden. And the ranger is like, everybody, you need to pull your weapons now. Get in the circle. And they're like, Why? because I don't hear anything. And then all of a sudden something is like shaking the trees and coming out of the woodwork and whatnot. That's awesome. Um, uh, man, I, I uh, definitely, uh, oh, oh, sorry, <laughs> I got confused here with my chat. I moved my chat a little bit. There we go. All right. Oh, man. <laughs> um, uh, Deadman says D&D uh, &D second edition went into the ecologies of nearly all animals. Uh, yes, you can, as a matter of fact, during the heyday of Dragon Magazine, um, the ecologies of just about every real life and fantasy animal had its own ecology section, and then it was combined into a into a spiral note, not a spiral, a um, loose leaf notebook 
um, that you could purchase different sections of it and put it into the book. I don't remember what it was. It's like a compendium comes to mind, but uh, using that ecology can really enhance your setting. And especially if you if your setting is, <laughs> especially if your setting is, is something fantastical, you know, a, a desert of black sand, um, oceans of, you know, red fluid or something, whatever the case might be, this is a way for you to turn the volume up on that as well. <laughs> Oops. Don't milk the wrong part. Um, uh, yeah, for those who don't know, I'm responding to the chat in the Discord. So if you if you join Fantasy Grounds, uh, the Discord, you go over to the left and slide down to the boiler room. So we're down there as well. Um, uh, Polora says, I don't think you need to go crazy. Showing it a couple of times will make the world feel more rounded. Could even run into plot hooks and things. You know, owl bears are dangerous during mating season. Exactly. And for me... I love using any tool I can to modulate the tension and pressure in my world so that if the PCs, if your player characters are stuck in analysis paralysis, right? They, if they, if they plant their feet and stop moving, the world should be moving around them to cause them to move. It's the person that's, that says in our world, a big, uh, a big storm is coming up the coast and the people are like, huh, I've been here for tons of coasts. I'm not moving anywhere. Ha, I'm folding my arms. Pshaw, right. It, the, the weather's going to move them, right. When their, when their home falls into the ocean, they get struck by lightning. They have three feet of snow around their bodies. The weather will move them. Animals move people out in the wilderness, right. If, if the PCs are like, Hmm, what are we going to do? I don't know. What are you going to do? I don't know. What do we should do? I don't know. What should you do? No, let's take a let's take another 38th long rest, right? When when someone hears that the owl bears are dangerous during mating season and the PCs don't move, now all of a sudden you have a a reason to spawn more and more of these creatures, right? Okay, you okay. If you want to stay here in the dark wood, that's fine. But you do realize that more and more of these creatures are coming around and you're just in their way. And this is a great way to, to push the encounters and to, to push the PCs to act. Now, which do, what how they act, eh, that's not your choice, right? Um, they want to dive headlong into danger, that's okay. If they want to, if they want to continue their ability to resist, that's fine as well. <laughs> there we go. Uh, Reclawary, what's going on? Um, uh, Fifth Viol says, for example, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Rickard says, and then the cow king arrives to protect its cow herd subjects. <laughs> yeah, being silly, but that's that's actually a true thing, right? With some animal species. Uh, fifth of y'all says, uh, for example, male lions are bigger and stronger generally, but female lions are more cunning and agile. Uh, I believe it's because the female lions do most of the hunting and tend to be the most aggressive in protecting the young. So you could absolutely change change the abilities like what's uh, uh, what's a great ability uh, the sharks uh sharks go on a frenzy when blood is is released into the water right you could absolutely add say that trait to a uh, mama animal protecting its young if the pcs go after the young right hey the bear is not just dangerous it's going to go into a blood frenzy if you if you start to harm one of its little uh, cubs you know what I mean? Yeah, enrage ability or add add the barbarian rage ability to the creature. Just stack it on top of it and go, listen, in, in this particular encounter, the, the animal doesn't want to confront you and just wants to threaten you and get you to go in the opposite direction. But if you plan on, you know, if, if there's that PC that's like, listen, move out the way. Those are my experience points. Maybe that cave bear is like, the hell you are touching my cubs. <laughs> you know, and a great way for your druid or ranger or woodland woodland experienced character, maybe a wood elf or whatever is in your game, to step forward and go, whoa, 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 whoa. I think it just wants us to leave, you know, and it may be speaking to it and trying to calm, you know, calm the creature down. Like, we're going to leave. We're just going to move the other way. And does it need to be combat? No, it's just an encounter. But that encounter might lead to other things like a couple of dead goblins <laughs> around the cave bears, a territory and the PCs are like dead goblins. 
what are they? Maybe they were scouts. Uh, we better keep an eye out, you know? And maybe one of the PCs is like, hey, why don't we lead the goblin scouts towards us, towards the cave bear? The cave bear would kill the goblins, right? And then they'll never know that we were in the woods. It's just a, one, one encounter can stack on top of another. It doesn't need to be forgotten or anything like that. Uh, uh, Dead Man says the... They were called the monstrous compendiums. That's it. The monstrous compendiums that you could acquire. Uh, they were wrapped in cellophane and you could acquire, say, aquatic creatures or aberrants or giants. And they were in these. Uh, you not you didn't just get the stat blocks in second edition, but you also got like their ecologies and their behavior and some uh, some hints on how to role play them. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty cool. A little expensive, but that was it. That was in 90s. Um, um, ooh, uh, Aliyup says, uh, I remember the monster ecologies that, that may hence the reason that, uh, th that certain tribes worship certain beasts. Uh, I usually have that, that for dragons, PC slay the baby, the mama will track and hunt them down one by one if necessary. So I'm going to go with the, uh, the reason why certain tribes, um, worship certain types of beasts, their, the relationship in hindsight, we may understand that, okay, well, the animals really aren't of a divine nature. This is just their behavior. But um, again, like we mentioned yesterday, the relationship between humanity and the animals may be something that we can draw upon. For example, during, during a migratory season, the people may migrate with those animals because those animals can find, let's say, shelter, water, um, vegetation to feed on and so certain tribes will follow herds and as they migrate or move around um move around certain locations especially let's say it's the um, it's the dry season and they're moving to find sources of water well maybe the humanity it themselves like we don't have diviners we can't find the water sources all the rivers are drying up but these herd of animals know where to go so we're just going to follow them um lots of animals also are uh, we mentioned yesterday, and we can we bring up today that many animals are sensitive to things that we are are not. Whether it's scent, movement, heat, um, dangers, particular dangers um, that are undefined in the environment. So, uh, the idea of training dogs that can <laughs> smell out terminators, you know, um, dogs sensitive to spell components, um, animals trained to sense uh, to detect water to 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 help them hunt down other predators or prey, to um, to re receive something from animals once you kill them and use them for their their parts um, wholly and in part. For example, uh, killing an animal and using its skin for fur, using its poison glands to use to coat your javelins or arrows to yet hunt something else, to make water skins out of its bladder to or out of its stomach um any number of things and of course in an arcane world who's to say that making a concoction a soup out of the eyeballs of a certain creature of course with the help of a shaman or uh, an apothecary or herbalist or something won't give you some sort of benefit or bonus or something like that uh, uh Reclary says um says uh, Japanese uh, Shintoism would be very interesting to explore and possibly incorpor um, incorporate elements from it into a setting or um, ethnic group or tribe. Exactly. And again, these are things that you can insert even after you've already started. You're like, man, you know what would be cool? I know we're only we're three games in, but I want to include this element, just, just this little touchstone from something that's in real life and added into the world. Hell yeah. And who, who again, Something like owl bears might be extremely dangerous to us. You go over the mountain range, and the people living over there are like they're not dangerous to us. Once you know, you know what they are and how they behave, we don't even think about it. You know, their their humanity's relationship to them might be completely symbiotic, 
And that is a cool thing to draw upon, especially if somebody else wants to play a PC from this other area, right? Uh, Polaris says, worship ties into auguries. The appearance of a flock of ravens could be a bad omen. A duck walking into your house could be good, and you should feed it. <laughs> yeah, you should feed it. But you're, you are absolutely correct. A flock of ravens overhead might, might um, give a sign and be a bad omen, um, both both through arcane means and realistic means. For example, a flock of ravens overhead somewhere may may be a sign that there's a dead body. And so, you know, we uh, animals tend to stack on top of each other for various reasons. So the PCs go and kill something, great. But if they kill it and leave its dead body, most of the time it's the dead body hanging around, you're going to get things that are going to de decompose it. Not only will it decompose on its own, but you're going to get um, lots of uh, insects are going to come and, and infiltrate its body. Those maggots are going to be deposited by insects. They're going to grow into other insects. Um, and then all of a sudden it's going to be have a swarm of flies around it. Well, we, you know, if you're using role playing game, pull out your swarm of insects, right? And then a swarm of vultures is overhead. And then you get something even bigger that feeds on carrion, like maybe do jackals feed? Something uh, predatory like jackals or hyenas or something might end up coming into the area. And then the dead creature, maybe something large, like who knows? Let's say it's an ogre. Let's say an ogre was killed in out there in the woods. That this dead ogre could affect the ecology of the other creatures around it. Some of them will run away from it. Some are going to come towards it, you know, <laughs> mountain oysters. <laughs> are, <laughs> Rickard says, are you saying that everyone in that area thinks that owlbears are a hoot? <laughs> You're so wrong. Oh, uh, that's, that's bad. Ba -dum, boom, ba -dum, boom, boom. <laughs> yeah. Um, Man, Rocky Mountain oysters didn't. Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, Aliyub says, uh, shamanism, spirit guides, and such. Absolutely, and what a great way to reskin, uh, to reskin some of your, uh, you know, instead of just uh, wizards, um, oh, what a mountain oysters, meatballs, prairie oysters, calf fries, cowboy oysters. <laughs> what the hell. <laughs> I did not know. Wow. Did not know that. Cattle fries. Okay. <laughs> I would have to go a little deeper in that. I'm now getting a little bit hungry. Um, uh, Ali says the beast represents a philosophy. That's an idea. Yeah. The owl represents wisdom. Snake represents de deception and such. Exactly. And much like we layer onto it in our own world, um, certain external forces like the snake being the liar in in a, an arcane world that might actually be very true um you know the the flock of ravens you know that flock of ravens following the group along as they travel through the dark woods might be in the employ of a hag that's nearby or someone realizes like you know what for you know if that flock of birds is above us for three days hence or longer I bet there's a there's a shaman around that's watching us. And other players are like, no, they're just birds, dude. <laughs> um, oh man, yeah, the, yeah. So Polaris says, yeah, those gnolls are laughing too. Uh, that's another thing. Animals uh, and beasts tend to make noises. They communicate with each other in in various forms, whether they're roaring or calling out. Birds do the same thing, whether they're making uh, mating calls or calls of danger, calls of pain. If they are uh, 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 trapped in a pit or their limb is trapped in a bear trap, or they've been, they fell down a muddy embankment and become impaled on a barren sharp uh, spike on a tree or something. Um, animals get swept down rivers. Um, some animals are attacked and pounced on by others. Maybe some of the sick, yeah, Rickard says there is murder about. Exactly. The, the 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 beasts that are in and around the area could give clues as to what's going on in the area, um, as well as us stumbling upon the beasts in the region that are in the midst of doing what it is they normally do. Um, 
finding beasts that are sick or injured or trapped, um, finding one that's fallen into a into a pit, right? Could also, if if the players are going along and they find a wildebeest that fell into a pit, someone looks around and goes, this isn't a natural pit. Someone dug this pit. So now, A, you understand that there will to be around or whatever, water buffalo or whatever the case might be. So not only are they around, but there's maybe a tribe. So now you have evidence that there's a tribe and you also have evidence that there might be other pits and the PCs need to watch their step. So you've included pit traps. You've included um, uh, maybe some kind of social interaction because they might find these other tribes people and they don't know how violent or social they are. Uh, they might be a, a great contact or they might be enemies. And you have a herd of animals floating around and all that given to you by one simple encounter of, I hear something, it's in a pit, what's down there? Hmm, right? Uh, maybe once once these creatures fall down there, the people make hear the noise of this thing uh, begging to get out of the pit and maybe the people come around to go and of course kill it while it's down in the pit. Maybe they go, they're going to use it for a festival or they need it for food or maybe the pit was designed to capture somebody else like an, an enemy tribes people and this thing fell into it and they're like, oh damn, now we got to get this thing out of there because we were using this to, to surround our village and defend our village by having, you know, things fall into the pit. You know, maybe the goblinoids that were attacking the wood elves were supposed to fall into it or something and they didn't uh and any number of inf bits of information could be brought about by the beasts um in addition to going going further into the shamanistic and shintoistic forms of um dealing with animals it's possible that uh yeah, James uh, Lindell says, and if you kill it, you might offend the tribe. Exactly. Um, one one way to appease the tribe might be we're not gonna we're not dealing with you at all. And we, yeah, we can lead you through the dark woods, but you need to go get us another uh, uh, another water buffalo, right? You need to go go find the herd, get us another one, and then maybe we might parlay with you. So not only are the PCs tasked with finding something, they also have to bring it back. And maybe even the act of bringing it back might draw to them other, other types of predators, right? So <laughs> again, traveling through the environment, tracking down the, the herd, killing something in the herd. Okay, somebody snipes it, boom, kills it, bam. Okay, great. Now we got to get it back. How much does it weigh? Uh, wow, hmm, it's going to take all three or four of us. We're going to have to construct something to drag it back. Okay, so you drag it back, but... It's dead. So are other predators going to come after it? Some some predators don't like to eat things that are dead. They only eat a fresh kill. So maybe some kind of carrion creature wants to come after it. How long does it take to get back? You know, um, there's so many things you can include in it. As a matter of fact, in the uh, here's a little bit slight a slight plug in one of the cinematic environments books that I've um, that I wrote in the uh, Plains and Grasslands. There are rules for herds because a herd represents not only just a food source, but um, a defensive source. Uh, people can run along and inside of a herd to protect themselves from um, being attacked from outside of the herd. Basically, uh, a herd of dozens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands could become like meat shields for a, a tribal people being hunted by their enemies, um, but they also are a danger, right? You don't want to get trampled. You can very easily get trampled by these things as they panic. Uh, they are also, it's a great way for you to use a herd as a means to detect dangers, right? Hey, they're, they're, maybe they're far more sensitive, more perceptive to dangers than you are. Uh, so if you travel with the herd, maybe their higher perception is able to detect enemies sneaking up on you. Like, well, we don't need to worry about once they start to panic, we need to panic. Um, yeah, Plur says gifts of herd animals used to be common. Dowries, for example. Yep. A group may not care for gold coins, but they could, they, they could do with a couple more goats. Exactly. And, um, we, Again, we brought this up yesterday. A, a great mission, uh, actually an excellent mission for PCs is to, to capture an animal for the purpose of a gift, whether it's like a dowry for a marriage, a um, maybe a, a noble is being 
uh, becoming the new king. There is a marriage and the PC is the brother of his sister who's getting married or it's for a festival and it's, it's comp it's a good omen for someone to get the egg of a giant bird or something or the, the egg do griffins lay eggs or give birth to live griffins. Hmm. But whatever the case might be, finding a baby version of that and bringing it back so that it could be domesticated and trained may be a good omen um, or a pegasus or something. Finding a, a, a beast or the opposite, um, leading a beast far away. Uh, think of the movie Dune and the giant uh, sandworms, right? There could be, uh, yeah, something... Uh, Griffins lay eggs. Uh, thank you, Reliquary. Um, Griffins lay eggs. So maybe getting a, an egg and bringing it back before it cracks. Remember, it's very fragile. Or fragile plot point enough, <laughs> right? Bringing, bringing back one of these eggs and uh, bringing it to fruition, keeping it warm, making sure it doesn't crack. Um, you know, the wizard over, over top of it using its prestidigitation or thalamic... I think it's prestidigitation, keeping it warm, or the druid or something, you know, and having to bring it back another 30 miles after you climbing up those those huge mountain peaks to retrieve it. And let's not forget that Griffin Mommy might be quite pissed, and it's 30-mile territory uh, uh, might be flying after you for some reason, you know. Um uh, Polaris says, just in case you didn't know, there was or is a group of shepherds in France who used stilts to watch over their charges. Are you serious? The stilt walking shepherds of Landes. That's kind of cool. Amusing planet. Um, there's so many. Wow, that that is really cool. Uh, for those who don't know, that is that is a that is a very interesting image and a great one too. Um yeah, Halu says it's flying for a reason. It wants his egg back. Yeah, the Griffins are like, what the hell is, like, why are you stealing my eggs? I want my children back, right? <laughs> that is that is the thing. And um, our, our um, interaction with a lot of these animals is important as well. I believe there's a tribe, a jungle tribe that wears masks and they wear the masks facing backwards on the back of their heads um, so that predators that try to sneak up behind them see the faces of human beings and turn the other way. Um, <laughs> Rick says, that's great. Now all I hear is, everybody's heard about the bird. Thanks. Everyone's heard about the bird. <laughs> now that's the word, bird, bird, bird. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, increase the threat, especially if it's the mama. And now, what if the mama calls out and cries out to others of its of its like, right? Maybe the mountain, maybe this mountain range is a place where um, flocks of griffins settle down and find their own little niches to lay the eggs for their young during a particular season. And this is the best season because this is when you get maybe dozens of griffins that perch on the mountain during a particular season. PCs go up to steal an egg, and then they elicit this, you know, this <laughs> almost this griffin-like war. And uh, maybe it elicits some other things. Maybe it's a violation, and the noble knew it was a violation, but they figured, eh, PCs, we don't know them. They don't know us. We'll send them up there. If they get killed by the, the Aracocra that live up there as well, who find the griffins who live in a symbiotic relationship with the griffins, eh, who cares, <laughs> you know? Um, oh, Pelora says the griffin in The Witcher is super aggressive because its mate gets killed. Exactly, exactly. Maybe it turns extremely feral and would have left humanity alone if it wasn't for the stealing of this egg, which in many ways may elicit yet even further encounters. Uh, the, the, the village people who kind of worship the griffins and uh, and worship the byproducts of them, maybe gathering the feathers of the griffins to make cloaks with them and some of their magics. Maybe the griffins um, somehow lead the tribes to safer areas or in a strange way, uh, the, the tribal people that wear the cloaks 
of feathers of the griffins are left alone. So the griffins kind of protect them because of what they're wearing, uh, just by an instinctual level, leaving them alone, but attacking their enemies. I mean, there's so many things. Uh, I could even imagine some of the villagers may even curl up inside of the nests of a griffin with these feathered cloaks and the griffin just lays on them, giving them warmth during the winter seasons and, and such. And in return, the villagers may leave something inside of the nests, like maybe some like raw meat or something or some other gifts inside of them, uh, maybe even little bits of fibers or strings for the griffin to make their little nests. And so there's this like symbiotic relationship. They don't even question why these people are wearing cloaks. They just smell them and oh, it smells like me, hmm, whatever, no big deal. Um, <laughs> I, it's crazy off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> forget balance when you're the thief. <laughs> yeah, they don't want to. You don't want to forget balance if you're a thief trying to steal that egg. It says, uh, Alioub says, hmm, what if the mama grabs the thief and her stolen egg and brings it back to the nest? <laughs> well, for the thief baby food, <laughs> yeah. Oh wow, I've got food. Let me chomp this up and regurgitate it back into the mouths of my young. <laughs> hmm, boy, this this gnome tastes pretty good. Um. <laughs> uh, Rickard, the, the village people that worship the griffin. <laughs> Thanks. Now I went from bird. Bird is a word to YMCA. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was so bad. I'm not going to sing the song. I'm going to get tagged uh, by, by YouTube. But the there's so many things that, that animals, if we just sit back and think about it just a little bit more, um, they're not just a bag of hit points. They are so many things. Yeah. Then go west, my friend. There's so many things that we can pull from um, in terms of using them. Now, as far as gaming statistics goes, as, as far as the die rolls go, uh, modifying their statistics up and down can give us a really great sense of, of, and narrating, giving us narrative elements as to why their statistics are higher or lower is a great thing to pull from. For example, uh, the village people that breed certain animals for certain things. Uh, horses are a perfect example of being bred for certain purposes. Draft horses are big and strong, but they're not the quickest. There are other um, horses bred for racing, horses bred for uh, long distance travel, let's say for scouts or something. Uh, based on the region you are in, some horses are naturally maybe more durable in the higher climates or colder climates than the warmer ones, um, et cetera, et cetera. And taking care of them is a skill unto itself. Uh, brushing them down, shoeing horses, feeding them, uh, using medical care on animals is another thing. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Reliquary says, interesting fact, if you kill a wasp, by splatting it on your skin as it stung you, the dead wasp will leave pheromones of danger or threat. I, di I didn't know that. I mean, I I knew that they used pheromones. I didn't know that that was a, that was a thing. Um, and other wasps nearby from the same hive will actively seek out the pheromones and attack the threat. And Dead Man says bees do the same thing. Yeah, we really haven't talked about about swarms and insects, but that's just that's one more thing that you can stack onto something uh, very much like, <laughs> I hear you. The, that's one more thing we can stack on to make ourselves uh, a, a large group of um, BFF creatures, uh, meaning like, like the bear, <laughs> the bear that goes into the beehive and upsets the swarms of bees and the PCs come along the bear that's got his paw stuck down into the beehive to get, um, as it reaches up into the tree and goes to get some of the honey. And the PCs are like, okay, we, we just stumbled upon the bear. The cave bear's kind of pissed off. And we're also being attacked by a swarm of bees that are also pissed off. This isn't great, right? You know, you can maybe there are um, there are some creatures that live in a symbiotic relationship with with some insects, or uh, attacking some creatures could actually infect you with like fleas or ticks. So you, hey, we're gonna go, we're gonna go kill the thing, and of course it's covered with fleas and ticks, and just by accident, up. Oh, Fleas and ticks are like, great, I get to jump onto somebody else, you know? 
<laughs> yeah, bears don't give a <laughs> don't give a black about bees. Just give me your honeycomb, right? Exactly. And it um what a what a great trap to set up, right? For say kobolds or goblins. Um a, a few a few of the minor ones go out. <laughs> Bears don't give a poo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tigger. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, Igor. Um, but uh, um anyway, <laughs> thanks for the squirrel, guys. Um, so an idea might be that some kind of woodland tribe of goblins, kobolds, halflings leads. <laughs> Uh, listen, I was an only child for a very long time. I often played with myself. Yes, I left that out there. So the, the idea could be that the, the, uh, a few scouts see the PCs. They run away. When they run underneath the beehive, they pull... <laughs> Yeah. They they pull a rope or a thread or a string or shoot it with a javelin or a crossbow or something, and the beehive lands between them and the PCs, and then the beehive goes after the PCs while the kobolds run away and leave, you know, uh, another trap, maybe like uh, a net in the in the tree line or whatever, or lead them towards a pit or something like that, right? Um, <laughs> Exactly. Oh man, I I used to. I'm not. I don't. I, I I have to get myself up. But I used to do the voices of just about all the cartoons and stuff that I used to watch. Um, Woody Woodpecker and Popeye and those old old classic cartoons. I I I might do a one of these days. I might do a whole rundown and just do like every voice back to back to back. I I used to do that. Oh man, but yeah yeah you you could you could stack a ton of of things with your animals right yeah it's good practice for gm i'll give you that yeah <laughs> different voices such i'm not really good with accents and voices but i i like mixing up my pronunciations of things <laughs> adventures based on old cartoons uh oh man that'd be hilarious yeah I'm going to steal myself a picnic basket. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, hey there, Fred. <laughs> oh, let me stop. Um, so one idea could be like, like, uh, yeah, Roadrunner and a coyote. Yep, absolutely. Who, who's to say that the 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 PC's going through the dark wood? It's always the dark wood, right? I don't know why that's the dark wood. Anyway, they're, so they're going through the woods. Boop, 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 boom, mind your own business, and then suddenly. Something panicked, runs out of the woods, shoof, right, right towards the party. You don't want to say, hey, can I make a, uh, a survival check or a nature check? Sure, make your nature check. Yeah, it's a giant bird, and it's complete. It's scared. It's panicked out of its mind, and it is blazing fast. Okay, um, what's happening? And one of the PCs is like, I think it's being hunted by something. Take cover, and then all, all of a sudden, you see like some some kind of a. Uh, some kind of lupine with like a rocket pack or something from maybe from like a, a, a gnome or whatever, trying to chase after the road runner or whatever. <laughs> it's like, did I just see, did we, did we, did I just see a coyote with a rocket pack and a receipt from the Acme supermarket? But I don't, what? You know, but anyway, I, I, I'm being, I'm being hilarious and silly with that, but, but, um, one creature hunting after another one actually is a very good thing to do. A griffin, go back to the griffin idea, a griffin, although it seems like an apex predator, could very well be hunting after something that's um, in and around the PCs when maybe the PCs are going after the herd of water buffalo and the griffins kind of sweep, swooping down to go after that same herd, right? <laughs> Smokey and the bear, only you can prevent forest explosions. Yeah, only you can prevent fireballs. <laughs> uh, Rickard says, uh, I mean, isn't that the whole premise for the honey heist? A mix between Yogi and Pooh? I, I suppose so. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, uh, Reclo 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 
Reliquary Sheej87 says, we need a D&D campaign set in a plane or realm or world like the Shimmering Isles from Bethesda Elder Scrolls. I'm not familiar with that, but I'm sure it is it is, it is uh, emblematic of what we're talking about. Um, ooh. Aliyup says, hmm, infrasound is a thing. Predators give off those these sounds when they roar at their prey to distill fear in the creature, hence frozen in fear. And infrasound disrupts the senses, such as causing disorientation in creatures. As a matter of fact, there are, from what I understand, there are some traits that many animals have. I think there's a bird that is able to slap its wings together behind its back, and it sounds like the cracks of thunder. Um, I've heard that elephants and hippopot hippopotami, the hippopotamus also sends out a kind of infrasound to communicate with others of its kind that elephants are able to, able to communicate over extremely long distances and uh, with a very high fidelity of communication, um, giving off uh, lots of information, and we don't understand how they do, do it. <laughs> oh, the fainting goats? The goats that freeze up and fall over? Yeah, the, oh, I don't, the fainting goats, I don't know what breed of those, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, the fainting goats, uh, absolutely. Um, I think you, you could add in the fear effect, stack on, say, some abilities from, if you want to have a world in which there's really only um, uh, giant sized versions of our natural creatures, you could layer onto them things that normally would be considered arcane, but they're just a natural part of those creatures, like dragon fear onto onto predators, right? They're just they just happen to be scary in your in your gritty survivalistic world. Um, uh, things like that. Yeah, uh, Ali goes on to say such as confusion, fear, possibly possibly some form of sickness. Uh, absolutely, those um, can gamify, but I always make the reference of turning the volume up because, you know, is there a real effect for your common person? Yes, for heroes. But if, if, in, if you're making a setting and you're like, you know, this is a low magic setting, it's survivalistic. I don't really, I want people to hunt for their food and survive out in the woods. I've already deleted or mitigated the effects of say, create food and water or good berry or something. But I also want to make, I don't want dragons and otherworldly creatures. You could just reskin some of them to be a hyper, um, a hyper actuated form of those actual monsters. The lion that makes the roar that sends people running in fear or frozen in fear or something is a, is a great idea. Plur says, I was trying to think of alternative to the goats, a cheap animal that can deter predators or at least stop them from attacking the main flock. Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, in we've gotten to the hour mark. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, in classic uh, gaming back in first edition, people would take chickens into the dungeon to let the chickens run wild it, to distract predators, um, to have them, you know, get hit by the spike traps in the dungeon and things like that. Yeah, I, taking goats along with you. Yeah, of course. Uh, tying them to a tree and and watching the predators go after the goat instead of the the far more difficult prey, which are the the adventuring party. Um, that that's a ex easily use usable uh, distraction. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here, crit fail on a save. Have you seen the fainting goats? Like, <gasps> pow. <laughs> All, right. All right, guys. Uh, we've got to the hour mark. Um, I would like to say goodbye to all of you. Thank you very much for participating. Everyone uh, um, who's who's new to the channel, uh, I appreciate your your attention. Thank you very much for joining <laughs> in, in this endeavor. Um, tomorrow is World Building Wednesday. We're going to continue our talks with Beast. Um, I have to, unfortunately, go off to work. So guys, everyone, thank you very much. Have a great day. I'll see you later. Bye.